All right, we should now be live, and there's already a lot of questions lined up for me to take. Uh, the first question is a meta question. Should we wait till the stream starts to ask questions? Kind of a funny way to begin uh, asking a question about asking questions that were I to answer, <laughs> yes, you should wait. It would already be uh, having asked ahead of time. So we're going to jump over that. Uh, BKBK, how do I deal with friends who disparage my choice to study philosophy? I'm um, sorry if the question is too self-centered. Um, you know, I, I think that's that's uh, a common thing to happen, whether it's um, studying it academically, you know, becoming like a philosophy major or taking philosophy classes, or um, studying philosophy on your own. I suppose you could, you could, uh, there's a couple things you could do. One is remind yourself that um, people who disparage philosophy generally either have no idea what philosophy is or have only encountered it in its kind of debased textbook, um, crappy YouTube video, whatever it is, you know, terrible intro to philosophy class forms. And so, you know, you can you can kind of I wouldn't actually like say, well, you don't know what philosophy is or anything like that, because that's a conversation that then generally just turns into a big argument. But you could you could keep that in mind. And, I, you know, I would I would also say um, maybe consider how close you want to be with these people and how much time you want to spend with them. I mean, it's one thing when your family disparages philosophy, which uh, was the case for me. I still have, you know, relatives. You know, I've been I've been in this business now officially since 1990 so now we're talking you know 30 years and i still have you know relatives who think it's cool to come up to me at the annual family reunion and like make jokes about philosophy and <clears throat> i quit caring about that a long time ago um in part because you you really have to you know you, you got to make a decision um but you know i would i would start looking for new friends <laughs> quite frankly <laughs> You don't have to be friends with anyone in particular. Uh, there's that old saying, you know, you, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your, your family. And then, you know, uh, you, uh, the other third thing I would say is important is remind yourself that um, whether philosophy is worth studying or not doesn't depend on what anyone else thinks about it. It's got a long track record. You know, it's clearly been important in, in many brilliant people's lives. And, you know, you can you can sort of, take heart in the fact that you're participating in that, I would say. Um, Nick asks, are there any phenomenologists who you'd highly recommend who aren't prominently discussed? Yeah, I mean, the biggest one is Mock Shaler. Um, there's this genealogy of phenomenology that gets done in continental philosophy where it's Husserl who like invented it, and then Heidegger came along, and maybe Merleau-Ponty and Sartre were doing some cool stuff, and then it was Levinas, and then Derrida, and Jean, you know, Jean-Luc Marion, and maybe you throw Michel Henry in there. And they're all worth reading, of course, but they're just, that's sort of like going into a, a vast field and, and taking one path and saying, this is the, the entire field, right? So Mach Shaler was as important as Husserl was. Um, as a matter of fact, you notice Heidegger talks about him in Being in Time. Um, I would also say there were some early people who were just as important in towards phenomenology who were not calling what they're doing phenomenology. And so I have in mind um, Maurice Blondel and Henri Bergson a little bit later than him in, in France both of whom are clearly doing phenomenological projects. And then there's Gabriel Marcel, who is um, doing phenomenology as well, right? Um, very early on, and the guy who actually, uh, uh, the first person to use the word existentialism in, in French. Um, you know, and then there's Edith Stein. She's really well worth reading. Um, you know, if you're into literary stuff, uh, uh, Roman Ingarden, although his work is really boring and dry, like Husserl's tends to be in many respects. Um, some of Husserl's stuff is really fun and, and cool, but man, some of it is, is really tedious. And Ingarden seemed to have managed to only figure out the tedious path. And 
who else? Um, I mean, there's so many others. There was this really cool uh, phenomenologist of religion, Jean Ehring, you know, who I was reading a long, long time ago. There's all this cool crossover stuff between phenomenology and other fields, whether it be Marxism or Thomism. Uh, you just got to kind of dig around. Hey, Bruce, it's good to see you here. Um, thanks for, for that goal. Uh, I'm not sure what you were <laughs> responding to uh, that I said with that, but that, that's very nice. Um, all right, let me take another one. Human evolution in regard to virtue ethics. Can you give some normal daily life examples of living virtuously? Which philosopher has been most beneficial to you in regards to living virtuously? <coughs> so I don't have a single philosopher who has been um, most beneficial to me. Aristotle's important. Plato's important. Plutarch, Cicero. Um, you know, uh, Epictetus, uh, Seneca, you know, you could go down the line. They all have contributions to make, even, even the Epicureans do. And then we get into Christian thinkers who are working off of them, like, you know, Augustine or Boethius or Anselm or Aquinas. Um, and then we get into the modern age. And then there's all the contemporary virtue ethicists who are so important as well. So I, I, don't, I don't have a single favorite person. But yeah, so what would be an example? Um, you know, one of the things I've been giving a lot of thought to lately, and I'm probably going to uh, try to engage in an exchange with Massimo Pigliucci about it, because he's, he's been talking about this quite a bit lately as well, is, you know, when it's okay to ban and block people who are being jerks or being, you know, tedious or... Um, tendentious or whatever in it, or just trolling in, in conversations online. And, you know, a lot of people feel like, well, I can't block anyone because marketplace of ideas, man. And that's clearly an extreme position and it, it lays you open to all sorts of exploitation and, and sort of, you know, it's bad behavior. And then there's the sort of like, well, I can do whatever I want. You know, it's my social media, which there's something too. And then there's, there's something in the middle some some rational approach to it, I think, that would say this kind of behavior is dickish and is not going to be tolerated. And you want to do that? Go do it somewhere else. Uh, you're not doing it here in in, in my area. Um, this stuff is, you know, uh, kind of kind of pushing the envelope. But I'll I'll go along with it. This is this is a positive example of back and forth discourse about controversial topics. I think that could be, you know, an area of virtue ethics. Um, we could do some exploration of that. But, you know, another great example I was thinking of as I was looking at these questions when I was just getting set up, Aristotle has this entire discussion of generosity. In the older translations, it's often called liberality, but generosity is a great example of it. And then, you know, you could look at like Cicero's On Duties that has a discussion of generosity uh, and and uh, uh, affection and, and beneficence. Um, when should we give to other people, whether it be money or time or attention or things like that? That falls under virtue ethics. And so I, I think there's lots of daily examples of, of that if you think about where we devote things on a, on a daily basis. Lenny Penny, I just started reading Nietzsche, and he's pretty hard to read. I like, I really like him, though. Do you have any tips on how to read and interpret him, and what is the best order to read his books in? Yeah, so don't expect consistency out of Nietzsche. Um, he does not have a consistent system. He deliberately introduced contradiction at, at times. Um, that said, there is, there is a sort of... Uh, you could call it a, a viewpoint that's that's quite widespread. Um, don't try to reduce Nietzsche down to like a key idea from which everything else flows. So that's that's people have done that, but that gives you bad readings. So it's not all about the eternal recurrence of the same, or the will to power, or perspectivalism, or this. It's more like a constellation with all sorts of complicated things. And the other thing to keep in mind is Nietzsche is a genealogical thinker. So he is, he's trying to trace out origins of things which are contingent and could have gone differently. There's no inherent telos within them. We, we produce teleological stuff out of it, but, but a lot of that is our sort of projection in his view 
on to those things. So like, you know, if you think about the genealogy of morals and the discussion of punishment, <clears throat> you know, um, Nietzsche says there isn't one reason for punishment. There's a whole complex of things that sort of like grew into this, 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 uh, general idea and practice that we have. And, um, so that, I think that can be helpful to, to keep in mind. There's usually a lot of stuff going on within Nietzsche. I'll mention one other thing too. So a lot of people read the birth of tragedy and there, there are a lot of readings out there where people are like, oh man, this is so cool. It's Apollo and Dionysos and like order and chaos. And that's not what Nietzsche is actually saying. Um, there's a third main approach that that ends up subsuming both the Apollonian and Dionysian, and that's what he calls the Socratic. And that's that. It's not supposed to be like a dichotomy that covers everything, um, you know, right brain, left brain, or any sort of nonsense like that. It, he's he's describing in that what he calls three noble approaches to the problem of life, which means that there's ignoble ones as well going on. And each of them can be, you know, quite complex and they can fuse into each other. The, the Greek Dionysian, according to Nietzsche, is different than the barbarian Dionysian. So I think you want to, when you're reading him, you don't want to make easy identifications, right? That might be helpful. Um, what else? Best order to read his books in. There really isn't a best order. Um, I mean, I, I think that it couldn't hurt to start out with The Birth of Tragedy, since it was his first book. Um, but it really depends on what you're what you're looking for. You know, some books are more systematic than others. So Genealogy of Morals and Birth of Tragedy are probably the most systematic books. And even they're not that systematic. And then there's all the rest, right? And and I think you can I think you can read around because you know I always say this Anyone, any, any philosopher that you're reading, expect to read and reread and reread. So it's not like you read a book first, master that, then move on to the next thing um, on the basis of like having totally gotten the first one down. You're going to come back to the first one. So if you started out by reading, um, you know, Beyond Good and Evil, that's fine. Um, you know, read it all the way through and then maybe read it again. Um, and then you'll, you'll eventually, you know, read some other works and then you'll come back to beyond good and evil and you'll say, oh, that's what was going on in this part. Now, now I get it. Right. And it's the same way if you're studying Plato or Aristotle or, um, Descartes or whoever, I mean, with Descartes, there's basically two books that almost everybody reads and that's, uh, the discourse and the, um, the meditations, but you know, there's also some other great stuff as well that you could read and that would help you better understand what's going on there. <clears throat> Matthew asks, um, I'm struggling to understand Jaspers encompassing. Are there any good Jaspers scholars? You know, I don't know. Um, I went to the, the Jaspers, the International Jaspers Society when I was a graduate student. It was uh, having a joint session with uh, the Society for Phenomenological and Existential Philosophy. And back then, I was really interested in existentialism. And so I was like, oh, Jaspers, that's cool. You know, I'll go, go check that out. And they were just a bunch of kooks. Um, there were like six of them. And I was, you know, I was the only person like under 50 in that room. And they're just talking back and forth. And it was sort of like a Jaspers admiration society, you know, and they were so happy to have some fresh blood <laughs> that um, it kind of, it was kind of a turnoff. And I, and I just never have looked for people who are um, secondary lit Jaspers, uh, you know, teachers or anything like that. So I, I don't, I don't really have anything useful to uh, contribute when it comes to that, unfortunately. Um, TK, is there anything someone can mentally tell themselves other than fake it till you make it when confronted with self-doubt, esteem issues, and academic study? So that's actually a great question. Um, yeah, I think there are, there are quite a few things that you could do. Um, the fake it till you make it, I don't think that that's a bad thing to do, but by itself, it's, it's really not going to be sufficient. Right. Um, I think it's also really important to see that, um, there's many other people in that, in that 
that mindset that um, I, not everybody necessarily goes through that. Some people don't go through that who should go through that because they're, they're actually not very good. And uh, they've just been told by, you know, other people that they're brilliant and maybe their class position, you know, allows them to get away with that or something like that. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people go through doubts about themselves and their abilities and their preparation and stuff like that when it comes to academic study in general and philosophy in particular. Um, so knowing that you're not the only one and that it's a common occurrence, I think can be for many people quite helpful. And I will tell you that I myself at different points um, have gone through that, you know, and very often it was, it was interesting. You know, you, you, you like, you realize you're going to participate in something. So I'll give you a good example. I was fortunate enough to be the most junior scholar selected for the last of Notre Dame's um, Erasmus Institute faculty summer fellowships. And it was to study with Alistair McIntyre at Notre Dame um, over the summer and this, this seminar thing. And there were 10 of us who were brought together. And I think he told me afterwards that one of the reasons why I got in is because I was doing prison education at the time and he had an interest in prison education. Um, and I, it was also, so the, the, the focus was practical rationality and uh, McIntyre always does this thing where there's like three different things he wants to compare. One was, um, rational, you know, rational choice theory or decision theory and its roots in Hobbes and Hume, uh, in terms of desire. Another was Aristotelian Thomism. So Aristotle and St. Thomas. And the third was, was, uh, Freud and Lacan. And so the psychoanalytic approach. And I actually, you know, was doing work that straddled all three of those, whereas almost all of the other people in the seminar were doing one or two of those at most. So, you know, when I looked at the participants and they're all like professors here and there, you know, and they've got all these publications and stuff like that, you're like, oh man, this is going to be, this is going to be kind of tough, you know? And you know, I'm kind of just a nobody who happens to be interested in this stuff. And then you get there and you meet the people and you find out that, you know, they, they, they say dumb things and you're like, Oh, okay. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm not that, that, you know, backwards when it comes to this and, and they've got huge gaps in their own education and, and, you know, and they've gone to the good schools too. And then you could, you could be like, Oh, you know, that proverb about everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. It turns out it's that way in academia too. So, you know, you can, you can tell yourself, um, what I'm feeling is perfectly normal and it, it doesn't have to determine how things are going to go for me. The other thing I would say too, is, um, you know, take chances. Um, I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen if you, if you say something in class, people are going to laugh at you. Okay. Well, screw them. They, they don't really matter that much. And if you learn something out of it, that, that'll be good. All right, Mr. Big Weak Knee. Do you buy the stoic idea that the only things with being are material? How are immaterial things like lecta real if they don't participate in cause and effect? I mean, so I'll answer the first one first. No, I, 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 I don't buy, the, I'm, not, I, I'm not a materialist, right? Um, then again, if you ask me what am I, I don't, I don't really... I, I don't worry too much about those super foundational things because that's not how I build my philosophical views. And I will say that there are materialists who are not reductive materialists, you know, people who say, well, there has to be a material basis for things, but there must also be something that like transcends that and it comes out of the material, whether through emergence or some other way. And I'm attracted to those thinkers who would include people like Lacan or, uh, George Santayana, and I think the Stoics are arguably in that camp as well, um, because they're they're not reductive materialists, right? They're not they're they're not simply trying to break everything down in that way. They actually the classic Stoics believe there's gods, you know, and you got to explain how how the hell does that happen if you believe in some sort of atomism or something like that, um, you know? How do the how do the uh, non-material things have being. Being is not just what, what can, you know, 
um, have a material presence. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like a, a big problem. And I mean, do, do the lecta actually exert no causality? I mean, they don't exert causality on their own, but they certainly do seem to do so in relation to other things, don't they? So, yeah. I mean, the Stoic notions of causality are kind of complicated, and we don't actually have the, 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 the source text for that, so we got to reconstruct what they thought from other authors who are generally not Stoics, like um, Cicero, um, or you know, a little bit of stuff from Augustine, Plutarch, people like that. All right, uh, Equin, do you have a personal theory of consciousness or one that you find appealing? Um, I don't really have a theory of consciousness. I, 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 you know, it's interesting. People, long for a long time, you know, people would be like uh, talking about free will, and you know, compatibilism, and and uh, you know, libertarianism and determinism. And I'd get into these things, and I'd be like, well, I guess I'm a compatibilist, but I don't really care that much about that you know, the, the sort of grounding stuff. I'm more interested in how does the will actually work? What, what, you know, what determines it? How does it emerge from determinism and then have a moment of spontaneity or maybe some space of freedom and then come back into it? And, you know, I'm more interested in those sorts of things. So I don't, I, I don't know that I actually can say that I have a theory of consciousness as such. Um, I mean, I, I know, I, you know, I sort of take consciousness as something that we have. Um, I don't, I don't buy into the people who say, oh, consciousness can simply be reduced to brain states or something like that. Um, but I don't worry overly much about the, the problems of it. So, yeah. Um, all right. Let's see what else we got here. A lot of questions. I probably I should warn all of you too. I probably won't be able to answer all these these questions um, because there's more piling up than I'll be able to get to. Um, boy, what do you think about doing videos on Deleuze in the future? He's a difficult thinker. Many people struggle with. Yeah, I mean, I, there's lots of thinkers that I should do videos on. It's a matter of finding the time and the inclination to do so. Um, people can commission me to do do videos, you know, some of my Heidegger and Nietzsche videos are actually commissioned by, by people. And so, you know, for the time being, what I'm shooting videos on is stuff that I need for my, my own students in enrolled in my classes at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design or um, in the prison program that MATC, Milwaukee Area Technical College has. Um, so I've been filling in those sorts of gaps but you know, there's nothing to say that I, I couldn't do videos on Deleuze. It's just you know, it's just not a high priority. Just like doing videos on Spinoza isn't either. Uh, uh, you know, but if somebody wants to, um, you know, commission me and pay for the time, then then I can change priorities. But but um, you know, it's unfortunate. There's there's so many thinkers who I'd like to do stuff on, but finding the time is really a challenge. So. I mean, Deleuze is, Deleuze is worth doing, I'd say. Um, Ken, Sarah, what do you think are good criticisms of Camus as a philosopher? Um, you know, I think Camus, his commitment to atheism is just sort of a, a thing that he starts out with, and I don't think he ever really looks at... at um, religious thinkers without having the blinders on, um, which isn't to say that you'd, you'd have to like be a theist in order to do that. William James is a good example of somebody who I think is better in that respect. Um, what else? Um, I mean, he's, he writes, I don't, I don't mind his writing. Um, I actually enjoy reading his stuff, but a lot of people find the style in which he writes kind of convoluted and annoying. So I guess that's a criticism. Right? It's not a criticism I make, but it's a criticism I hear made a lot. Um, you know, I think a lot of people do criticize, criticize him as well for like not taking as clear of a stand on certain things as, 
as other people, but that's not, that's not that big of a problem for me. I think that when it comes to the complicated um, matters of our, our actual lives, which is what he was really interested in, um, we're not going to make it all perfectly fit. I actually like Kamu quite a bit. He's, 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 a, he's, he's one of my favorite interlocutors in many respects, especially when it comes to politics. Um, Dan the Man, coming with an update, did my presentation for my senior thesis for the Mississippi Academy of Science and got an award for presenting. Feeling pretty good. Nice job. That is, uh, that's really great. Um, yeah. Hold on to the good feeling <laughs> while well, you've got it. Uh, and it, 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 you've got something there that, that, that nobody can take away from you. So that, that's wonderful. Um, Nominus, where did you get Hegel's lectures? They seem hard to find. Um, I got, I, I got most of them at used bookstores or I ordered them years ago. I don't know where you find them today. I assume that, that, you know, they're available on Amazon, but I haven't done any looking for a long time because I, I've already got the stuff I need. Or I, if I can't, if I don't have it at home, I can walk down the street to Marquette University, which is about uh, 12 blocks from here. And I have library privileges there. They've, they've given me uh, courtesy faculty status as a, as a, you know, local scholar at um, Marquette. So that's, that's kind of nice. I don't know where you'd, you'd find them though. Um, all right. Uh, Frank, Franek Wojciechowicz. I'm sure I butchered your name there. What contemporary philosophers do you read and find them interesting or inspiring? Well, I mentioned, you know, Alistair McIntyre, of course, um, big fan of him. There's quite a few people who do really great history of philosophy that I think is, is of great contemporary relevance. So, you know, my colleague, Chris Gill, um, over at Exeter, uh, when I say colleague, I mean that we're both on the modern stoicism team. Um, Julia Annas is really great. You know, Margaret Graver, um, you know, there's, there's quite a few people in that sort of doing history of philosophy, but it's not, it's not the history of philosophy that's just like trying to trace out where people's ideas are. It's saying, hey, look, these ideas are relevant to the present. Um, A. Long is still around, major contributor to study of Hellenistic philosophy. Um, you know, in, in contemporary continental philosophy, <clears throat> somebody who I, I like reading is Agamben. Um, I don't read an awful lot of like, you know, cutting edge contemporary stuff in part because a lot of the people are going to be, you know, forgotten 20 years from now, <laughs> just looking back at what, what continental philosophy was like and who all the rising stars were, you know, 20 years ago when I was a grad student. Uh, I think that's a safe bet. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of read around and a lot of stuff, comes my way because people send it to me. So, all right, uh, Marcos, what is so in intricately satisfying about philosophy? Well, I don't know that it is for everybody. <laughs> you know, certainly my, my students are kind of half and half on that. You know? um, and, and philosophy isn't always fun to read all the time anyway. And it really depends on who you're reading. I think part of it is the idea of, of having sort of systematic viewpoints on things that are built out because we human beings do have a desire to understand things and to understand them, not just in an off on, Oh, I got the answer there. Let's, let's move on. But in sort of a more comprehensive way. So I think that that's probably part of it. Exercising your mind is probably part of it as well, but I, I don't know. That's, that's a good question. Um, Ken Sarah, who do I think are some worthwhile conservative or libertarian philosophers to read to balance out leftist thought? Well, I wouldn't read them to balance out leftist thought. I would read them because they're worth, they're actually worth reading. Um, at least, you know, most of them, some of them are worth reading just so like, you know, what people are, are talking about, even though their philosophy is not very good. <coughs> um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, with libertarianism, obviously Nozick is, 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 uh, really important. Um, there's, you know, there's actually a, a lot of discussion today going on about libertarianism. Um, and you know, the, the whole, there's, there's this website bleeding heart libertarianism that Matt Zwolinski got started. It's, it's worth reading around in that, you know, that sort of contemporary stuff. Um, I don't know. You know, when it comes to conservative philosophers, I find people who are movement conservatives generally kind of boring. And I don't know. I don't know that, you know, they're worth spending that much time on. Conservative doesn't really mean the same thing now as it did, say, 30 years ago, looking at where things are. Um, but if you're, if you're talking about like the vast sweep of like, you know, the last couple hundred years, it, it's worth reading, um, people who are, were considered traditionalists, um, to see what, what they were actually saying. Cause then you can see that the people who are being called traditionalists today or, or who are advocating positions today are really doing nothing particularly new. And they were like conservative conservatives, right? You know, the French revolution was a huge mistake and, and, uh, um, you know, we need to go back to this hierarchical authority thing. Um, so that would include, you know, the, the, the French ones all the way up to like Charles Marat. Um, but that's, you know, that's not particularly contemporary, you know, there's, there's Russell Kirk, the conservative mind, which, which is kind of good to, to read through. Um, he's, he's tracing out some interesting things, but yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to think about that more. All right. Um, Matt Tucker, I'm reading Hume's on the standard of taste. My teacher is asking us to, to examine the intersection of art and politics. Any idea where he's going with this? Not really, <laughs> not really, because I'd have to have a little bit more context. Um, so Hume's aesthetic theory is, is, you know, in a way it's like the person who's, who's got a good taste can zero in more and more and more on, on what's, what's actually uh, tasteable, right? So how do you apply that to politics? I, I don't really know. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure there. All right. Uh, I often discuss, this is from Mar Martin Costa, I often discuss and criticize the academic system on Twitter. Are there any books critical of higher education you're fond of? Um, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not, I, I haven't like read any contemporary stuff about that. And uh, I mean, the last book that I read that was particularly good in that respect was Academically Adrift. Now I think that was published 10 years ago, right? Um, and that's, you know, Richard Aram and I think Roska is his collaborator. Got to meet him actually uh, at at the he he came to the Culinary Institute of America where my wife was um, at that time either an assistant dean or a director and she brought him in and, and we got to have some some you know a meal together and chat about what was going on and at that time I was doing a lot of work with a collegiate learning assessment that he used as as an important part of his argument um, but I I'm not you know. I don't. I, I barely have the time to read the stuff that I want to read, so I'm not. I'm not drawing this primarily out of books. It's more just being an insider in the industry. So, all right. Um, unironically, how hard is it to do a PhD in philosophy compared to studying it as an undergrad? Thanks. Wow, that's a good question. That totally depends on um, where where you're going, right? I mean, some undergraduate educations might actually be better or more rigorous than some graduate programs, um, depending on, on what, the, what they're doing. So, um, I mean, I can tell you what you have to do in a PhD program. And, and you know, generally you don't just go right into the PhD program. I actually think it's a big mistake to go right from undergrad into a PhD program because you miss a lot of stuff along the way in, in the, you know, desire to be a go-getter and all that. Um, you know, so let's talk about a master's, right? First, you, you have to get your master's. And used to be in the old days that you actually had to like take a comprehensive examination. Nowadays, that's usually been phased out. 
but you still have to do about 30 hours of, of graduate coursework, six of which might be working on your master's thesis. You have to write a master's thesis, which is a you know more extended research paper than say a senior thesis or a dissertation as they call it in, in England. Um, and you know, master's thesis, probably going to be anywhere from 40 to 120 pages of, you know, work eventually produced. And then as a PhD student, you're going to also take another 30 hours of, of coursework. You might have to do some language uh, requirements. You might also have to do those at the master's level, or you might not, depending on the program. Um, you have to produce a prospectus, uh, and then the committee, you know, bats that back and forth, and then you actually get to write your dissertation. And a dissertation is basically a book. And it could be, you know, it could be short, like 120 pages. It could be long. Mine was about 375 pages. I've seen dissertations go to 700 pages. Um, and, you know, you have to put a lot of work into it. Ideally, you wind up with something that's publishable, but many dissertations don't, don't actually turn into books. Um, when, the, when they do, you can tell they, they're obviously a dissertation because of the way it's written and the, the footnoting. So, you know, there, there's a lot of work involved. Um, you also have to think about how you would, these days it's very important to think about how you would finance your, your education. Um, because there's, there's a lot of places that used to like, you know, have, have much more funding than they do for graduate students. And um, now maybe, maybe they don't. Um, you know, taking on student loans can sometimes be uh, a big burden. So, yeah. I, I, that hopefully gives you some idea about it. All right, let me scroll back up to where that question was. Um, Lenny Penny, what are my ideas on postmodernism? Will it lead to something good or something bad? Well, there isn't one thing called postmodernism, so that really can't be answered. Um, a lot of people throw the term around but have no, no real clue about what it means because it's not the same thing as relativism. It's not the same thing as Marxism. It's not the same thing as intersectionality. Um, there, there's no, there's no postmodernism out there that's going to lead to something. I mean, if, if they're right, we're actually, you know, when people were talking about postmodernism, they weren't saying, oh, it's, it's coming and it's this program that we have. They're saying, we're in post-modernity right now. That was what Leotard uh, was saying back, you know, when he wrote the postmodern condition. And that's what Jameson was saying when he brought out postmodernism, the cultural logic of late capitalism. And this is before the, the turn of the, the century. So, you know, um, there is, it's, it's not the kind of question that can really be, be answered. Of uh, the the M vlog, did Levinas have correspondence with the, the Vienna Circle? I don't know. I'm not a Levinas scholar. Um, that would be an interesting thing if he did, but I, I don't know why he would. Um, I mean, Wittgenstein, Russell, and Whitehead weren't in the Vienna Circle. Um, you're thinking of people like Carnap and and you know people who actually were in Vienna. Wittgenstein came from Vienna, but he. he moved to um, England, right? All right, uh, Alex brings up Robert Sokolowski as, as a phenomenologist who's worth studying. Yeah, that's that's true. He's a, he's a contemporary one. Now that I think about it too, uh, somebody else would be like in Sokolowski's age group would be uh, Adrian Pepperzak, who I, I don't know if he's still alive or not. If he is, he's in his 90s. He taught at Loyola for a very long time. He did work on Levinas. Uh, and uh, on Hegel and on phenomenology and, and quite a few other things as well. All right. Um, Ken, Sarah, could I explain or direct you to any good explanation of Camus' ethics of quantity? I don't do secondary literature very much, you know. Like I've said, um, you know, it, it comes up in, in Myth of Syphysis. Um, there's, he's, he, in, in the, I don't know that he actually, like, sticks with it so i wouldn't i wouldn't worry overly much about it 
Uh, Gabriel, are poets in the broad sense considered a separate class of artists? They seem to have intrinsic knowledge and wisdom about how to make certain things by nature, intuitively not learned skill. Well, that's that's a very romantic vision of poets. Um, as it turns out, poets are like any other uh, skilled artist. Lots and lots and lots of disciplined work before you get good at it. Um, you should you should go and take a poetry class sometime. One where they're writing poetry, and get your stuff critiqued, and then you'll you'll quickly you'll quickly. Uh, get rid of this idea that they, they know how to make certain things by nature and, or intuitively. There's so much skill that goes into it. I mean, you can have talent, um, but just like with music or just like with art, um, merely having the talent, that gets you in the door, and then it's lots and lots of work. So um, Ragriz Surgat, is there a clear boundary between philosophy and political science? If so, what, where is it? There isn't a clear boundary. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you go to one university and the curriculum will be divided one way, go to another, it'll be divided another way. I mean, you can say that philosophy doesn't do the, the quantitative analysis, but that's not all political science. There's also political theory, right? Um, so it's, it's, with most disciplines, the boundary lines between philosophy and that discipline are going to be rather contested and permeable. Um, and anybody who tries to tell you, here's where the dividing line is, is usually kind of selling you a line of BS. Um, all right, I'm going to start taking questions more from people who haven't been asking uh, them uh, so I can get to as many interlocutors as possible. Find me a film I can't refuse. Any tips for reading Kant's first critique? Yes, set aside a lot of time. <laughs> you know, use use uh, whatever resources <clears throat> you find available to help you out with it. It is some, some pretty dense stuff. With Kant, you know, I always tell uh, students two things uh, about Kant and his, his writing. Um, it's like cracking a code is the first one. You got to figure out what what his terminology means, and once that happens, a lot of things start to fall into place, and it becomes more it becomes less difficult to understand what he's saying. Then there's also the let's call it. Uh, wait a second, does he really believe that uh, sort of incredulity that goes along with with things? Um, and, and and the answer is yes, he does in fact believe that. So like when we're talking about Kant's moral philosophy, say in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, and he says essentially that, you know, um, duty has really nothing to do with happiness and um, that, you know, as rational beings, that's not why we were given reason to be happy, at, whereas most other philosophers say that, yes, as rational beings, there's some connection to happiness. People are like, does Kant really believe that? And you're like, yeah, yeah, that, that's what the guy actually does think. So, you know, I, I would I would approach it with those two things. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, I don't really have too much other advice to help you out with it. It's going to be a slog. Um, don't get down on yourself if you don't understand exactly what he's what he's referencing. Um, as a matter of fact, I would like I would like read through sections all the way through, even if you don't understand what's going on, and then go back and, and reread, right? Uh, all right. All right, here we go. Here's here's another new person. Stigger and Dew, can you explain how everyone is worth the same if they are? I think like a drug addict versus a surgeon, if you have to choose who has to die from an ethical viewpoint. Um, I mean, you can say that they're both, they both have the same intrinsic human dignity, but that if we have to choose between them, that will choose the one who's more valuable to the community. Those are, there's no incompatibility between those two things because they're two different ways of looking at it. Right. Um, they're, they're just not looking at the person in the same way. So uh, Stephen asks, I've just finished reading The Transcendence of the Ego, and I'm a bit confused on Sartre's rewriting of the phenomenological reduction. 
would you mind explaining how it fits into Sartre's work? It's been a long time since I've read that, so I, I, I don't I don't remember enough about it to to tell you anything with that. Uh, Watergate, is it bad that I have no questions concerning philosophy? Um, because you have no questions at this time concerning philosophy doesn't mean that you won't ever have questions concerning philosophy. So, uh, you know, and it's, it's not as if everybody has to be doing philosophy all the time. So I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, Brie Berta X, are you familiar with Haman's Metacritique of Kant? Haven't read Haman since graduate school. Um, I remember he seemed pretty interesting. Um, and uh, I don't remember all that much after that. So, no. Um, Dipra, Dr. Sadler, please simplify Derrida's spectrality. I don't know how you'd simplify it, you know. Um, I don't even remember, you know, which which particular works that that shows up in, you know. The stuff that I'm more interested in with Derrida is less his later works and more uh, the earlier stuff, but I don't spend a lot of time with with Derrida at this point. Um, Thomas Moore, uh, am I aware of Brian McGee? I am indeed aware of my, Brian McGee. His autobiography, Confessions of a Philosopher, is super interesting. That, that's great. I, I haven't read him. Um, I, I, I imagine it probably would be interesting. Um, all right. Um, let's see here. Let's find some new stuff and we can come back up here. Uh, Anthony, what do you make of the central theses of Jean-Luc Marion's God Without Being? Um, now, that's a work that, that I haven't looked at for a while as well. Um, I mean, I liked his discussion of the function of the icon. I thought that was really quite good. I think that Mario buying, you know, trying to use Heidegger and, and doing all this, this, uh, stuff about, you know, God has to be without being, I actually found a lot of that kind of ridiculous myself. Um, it's, it's, you know, it reminds me of this thing from from Leibniz, where Leibniz said philosophies are generally true in what they affirm and and false in what they deny. And uh, here we just got the cat jumping up, <laughs> a little sassy. Um, Marion is, you know, he's within that that sort of um, yeah, say hi to everybody, sass. He's within that that sort of uh, Heideggerian, you know. Metaphysics is bad kind of shtick. Um, and we're gonna save we're gonna save the world from the metaphysicians. And I just never found that plausible at all. Um, I, I like the examples that he used. I like his his discussion towards the end of the function of the, the homily in you know manifest manifestation. Um, so you know it's 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 kind of and, and he has a you know he's got kind of an interesting exegetical interpretation of the prodigal son thing in there as well. But I just, I don't buy into Mario's project, you know, and having met the guy and interacted with him. Um, I, I, you know, for somebody who's so big on the metaphysics of charity, the way he behaved towards uh, graduate students, not myself, but cause I, you know, I spoke French with him. So I was, I was like in the okay group. Um, was really kind of shitty, and and I didn't I didn't like it. And then I saw him quite a bit at the uh, Lumen Christi Institute, um, and, and just, you know, yeah, never really saw him as a his thing is all that viable. Uh, Francis asked, "Do I think Hegel's absolute logic was right in the idea of the self examination of reason, proving the necessity of reason for absolute knowledge?" Um, I don't really buy into, you know, I'll put it to you this way. I don't really buy into the sort of absolutist uh, project in, in Hegel. Um, I think that he's got some really cool observations along the way of the dialectic, and he's very insightful about a lot of stuff, but like the overarching big project of I'm, you know, I'm enunciating what uh, absolute spirit has, has uh, worked out. I, I just don't buy it. Um, history never ended. Um, I think that a lot of a lot of what Hegel's doing is is really 
like I said, really interesting, really innovative stuff. But oftentimes the grounding for it, it's just not there. Even though he desperately wants it to be there. And it doesn't have to be there in order for it to be interesting or useful, I think. All right. Um, Lauren Crawford, do you have a philosophical reading recommendations for grief? I've been struggling. Okay. Yeah. Um, it depends on what you want to look at. I mean, if you want to see what philosophers have had to say about sadness and grief, um, which might not, you know, might not be very consoling to you, but, but could be, could be helpful. I would say, look at the Stoics, look at, um, Cicero's Tusculan disputations, particularly, uh, the discussions about death and grief, book one, and I think what book, book four, um, there are, you know, and you, you can also think about looking at the examples of philosophers who had to deal with grief. Again, Cicero is a great example. His, his uh, daughter, uh, who was very smart and uh, very capable, um, he appears to have been closer to her than he was to his son, Marcus. Um, she died. Tolia. And, and he writes about this in, in his works, that part of what he's doing is consoling himself and taking his mind off of the things that um, otherwise would be occupying him by writing philosophy. I'm a big fan of Rilke as well. And um, Rilke talks quite a bit about, about death and about grieving and sadness and um, puts it in a, a different framework. Um, some of his poetry is about that, particularly the Duino elegies. So, you know, but I'll, I'll say this, um, grieving is always, is always difficult and one can only be helped out so much. Um, so a good bit of it is just other people being there and saying, oh, you know, I, I'm here for you, or uh, it's okay to be sad, or um, this won't be forever. Um, and sometimes just shutting the hell up and <laughs> just being there, <laughs> quite frankly, you know. And uh, I don't know. I don't really have too much else to say about about that. All right. Um, <clears throat> Do, do, do. Let's see what else we have. Nihar Ravi, do you have any tips for leading a more wholesome life? Um, well, <clears throat> I guess you have to you have to have an idea what your wholesome life is like. So that's probably worth some scrutiny. Um, you know, a, a whole I mean, a good life is is uh, I'm sort of a pluralist when it comes to that. You know, I'm I'm not with the the Stoics. Vir you know, you can live a wonderful life just by having virtue or something like that. I'm much more like Aristotle. You know, well, virtue is great. Virtuous activity is important. Meaningfulness is important, but relationships are also important. And you do need a little bit of you know wealth to like not be out on the street and have your life totally suck. Um, and and you know, there's other things as well. Health is important and. All of that. So I think you want to you want to think about what uh, what are the components of this wholesome life, and then what you have to do to to move yourself towards it. And generally, that's going to be some intentional way of living. Um, and there's lots of there's lots of ways to go about that. You know, again, I, I, I'm kind of a pluralist when it comes to those sorts of things. Um, you could you could pick up on what the Stoics have to say and use some of what they've got. You could look at what the later Platonists like like Plutarch have to say. You could take other things that are more contemporary. Um, there's all sorts of great resources for it, but it, but it's going to have to be an intentional way of of living. Um, Rapa asked, "Do you think that a philosopher's actions?" Specifically, their shortcomings should affect how they're viewed. For example, Heidegger's anti-Semitism or Rousseau's perversions, et cetera, et cetera, or Nietzsche not being the Ubermensch, we could say, or um, Descartes actually being a cooler guy uh, other than towards animals in reality than you would expect from his books. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, 
It, it depends, right? Um, I think if somebody's like, let's let's t say we take Irving Kopi, right? Major contributor to the study and popularization of logic. Um, I don't really know anything about Kopi's personal life, and I don't really care, and I don't want it. I, I, it doesn't matter, you know. If I found out that that he was uh, um, into child pornography, it wouldn't change the 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 logic books. I mean, I'd say, well, I, I don't want that guy, you know, near me, but, um, he's really a degenerate, but, um, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the way that he does logic. It, you know, it's, it's probably more important when we get to like things where it's, it's much more about, uh, human beings and society. So like philosophy of history or, um, philosophy of human nature, ethics, obviously social political philosophy, Right. So when we find out that, say, for example, Martin Luther King um, cheated on his wife, does that mean that, you know, we should look at the I have a dream speech or letter from a Birmingham jail or his, his uh, diagnoses of social dynamics differently? No, uh, probably not. Um, we can say that he was flawed. And um, but if we find out that, you know, if we, if we see him giving a talk specifically about uh, fidelity and marriage, then we might be like, hey, I don't know that this guy's, you know, the one to talk about that. Um, and, and so, you know, the answer is yes and no. Um, it depends on what the subject matter is and it depends on how much the bad behavior is, is affecting it or, uh, kind of invalidating it. Right. Um, so I think, I think it's probably enough to say about that. Uh, Thomas asks, any advice about how to deal with the terror of pandemic virus? Well, we're not at the terror point yet. I think the terror that's being produced is largely by governmental, um, responses to it, quarantines, right? So, you know, in China there, you could say there is quite a bit of terror going on. Um, and then there's the prejudice against, uh, Chinese people or people who are perceived as being Chinese, that that's happening as well. And we have to be careful. I mean, it, it's interesting. There's, there's like people who are Filipinos. <clears throat> I noticed this in my Twitter stream. who are like, Hey, y'all need to stop, um, you know, uh, being so concerned about coronavirus and looking at me as if I'm a threat to you and wondering why I don't have a mask on. I'm not even Chinese. I'm Filipino, but we're, you know, you're, you're kind of uh, falling into this. And I, I think when we have these concerns, it becomes really easy for there to be, um, uh, you know, it's almost like it, it primes things for thing for, for, for matters to go downhill. It's sort of like, you know, we, we had this uh, big scare about the um, swine flu back in, I think it was 2009, came to be nothing, right? Could have, could have gone really bad, but it came to be nothing. And we had all these people that were starting to panic about it. Um, that panic itself can become the driving force. And so, you know, I'll give you another example. It was non, non, um, uh, disease related. If you remember Y2K, Y2K is, you know, the year 2000, there was this big worry that all of our electronic devices were going to quit, quit functioning and all our computers were going to melt down and everything was going to like grind to a technological, uh, stop. So I was living in a trailer park at that time in Southern Illinois, as I was going to graduate school. And it was one of the better trailer parks, but it was still a trailer park. And so there were, there were, you know, quite a few people in the park who were, you know, buying into conspiracy theories. Many, many people were heavily armed in that trailer park. As a matter of fact, the FBI, or no, it was, no, it was ATF did a raid on <clears throat> one of the trailers and people were running guns out of it. <laughs> There's a whole story there that could be told. And that was, that was in our trailer park. So I was thinking to myself, you know, I don't think the computers are actually going to fail, but all it takes is like somebody to do something nutty. And then all these other people who are primed for the end of the world to happen, uh, to like get out and start doing stuff and, and shooting the place up and man, this is going to suck. Um, fortunately nothing happened, but I think that's that, that, that sort of thing can sometimes be the case. All right. Our brain hurts a lot. 
uh, asks, uh, am I familiar with millennial YouTubers like ContraPoints or Philosophy Tube? Do I watch their content? So I'm familiar with them. Um, I don't watch their content because I, you know, my, my time is, is rather limited during the day. And I, you know, there's very few podcasts or video channels that I actually do watch. And it's generally going to be stuff that I can try to learn something from. Um, the popularizing stuff I just don't see as, as worth my time. Um, and I know that my, my work, there is one that I watched with, with uh, Philosophy Tube, the one he did on the master-slave dialectic. And I, he, we had some exchange. He referenced my work in some of it. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I'm not into that sort of thing because Hegel's way more than the master-slave dialectic. And I think, you know, at this point in time, we probably, if we want to popularize Hegel, we should talk about other things like recognition, which is what actually is, you know, the master-slave dialectic is a tiny little moment within. Or we should talk about the other other interesting parts of the phenomenology. So, you know, they're doing their thing. They're actually getting way more views, of course, because, you know, Thai production um, and sort of easy to get into content. I, that's not the sort of thing I do. You know, I concentrate on um, sort of, I'm not that interested in production stuff. Obviously, you know, I've got a mic nowadays, but I'm, I'm kind of slow in that respect. And I'm interested in providing the best content possible, the stuff that's actually grounded in the texts and helping people to, to, to understand things. And so we're, we're kind of, you know, we're moving in, in separate paths and, and I just, you know, I don't have that much to, to do with them. So, yeah. All right. Uh, retro gamer. Do I consider Spinoza too dense, like Hegelian conceptions to present from his ethics or even too pre-modern in his deliberation of the affectations of ordinary men? I don't think Spinoza is actually that tough. I, I, I think that he didn't do himself a favor <laughs> by putting the ethics in that more a geometrical, you know, uh, sort of sort of thing. Um, but you know, when you actually when you figure out what he's doing again, when you, once you crack the code, it's really not that complicated. Um, and as with Kant, as I was remarking earlier, you could say, does he really believe this stuff? Yes, yeah, Spinoza really does believe that stuff. You know. There is one substance of which there are, you know, these attributes, two of which we grasp, and uh, we are modes of that substance. And uh, yeah, he, he's that's that's his doctrine. Um, I don't think it would be difficult to to do stuff on Spinoza. I, I think it'd also be quite easy to do it on his other works, like the you know Tractatus Theologico Politicus or the Principles of Cartesian Philosophy. It's just a matter of finding the time. You know, and I think what he has to say is interesting. I don't buy it, but I don't buy Kant. <laughs> I don't buy Bentham. And I don't buy, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that's in Nietzsche. But it's really interesting, you know, and, and worth worth uh, presenting. All right. Uh, let's see here. Candy asks, do I feel the exercise I've been doing of late has enhanced my intellect? No, not really. <laughs> um, I mean, when I go to the gym, and I've and I've been going to the gym for for two years, um, so I guess that is of late. Um, and I, and I, I, you know, I'll, I'll go through periods where I'm able to like do it three to five times a week regularly, and then something will happen. You know, sometimes it's it's uh, family related stuff. Um, you know, people are getting sick or we got to attend to different family issues uh, or the animals. Sometimes it's getting overloaded with, with uh, work. Um, sometimes I get sick. So it, it kind of comes and goes. Um, when I go to the gym, I'm doing usually one of two types of workouts. One is on the weight circuit and one is um, doing cardio stuff on, on other machines. And I'll put in my headphones and I'm, I'm listening to my metal playlist. And, um, you know, oftentimes like in between stuff, getting on Twitter and seeing what, what people are saying. And so it's kind of like me time. I'm not doing a lot of intellectual work. I'm not listening to podcasts. I'm not like thinking about, you know, Plato and what he has to say about stuff. So it, it, the, the activity itself, I mean, 
Um, I suppose being in better physical condition is probably helpful, but I don't know that it, you know, nobody's ever like, I've never had the sort of medical staff that, that focus on my brain treatment, my, my brain, uh, what is it? Brain, not brain states, um, brain health or anything like that. So, you know, I, I don't know that it would actually make any, any, uh, difference, um, but it's good to do, you know. I, the reason why I work out is I want to live a long life, and um, doing the kinds of things that I'm doing, cardiovascular stuff for for you know the, my my system, and lifting weights, which is good, to, you know, for for strength and also for the bone density and stuff like that. And then you know, when I have time, I'm going to start doing some other stuff, you know, flexibility and and who knows what else I'll I'll end up doing. Um, I want to have a body that is not going to be the, my sole source of attention as it's rotting and dying away and breaking down when I would like to actually be doing productive work and spending time with my, my kids and family and friends. I want to, you know, I'm, I'm approaching 50. I would like to live to 90 and have a decent quality of life. Now, whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know, you know. I did a lot of damage to my body, uh, uh, with, you know, in my teens and twenties with, uh, well, and even, even into my thirties to some degree with, uh, smoking and drinking, um, when I could like get away with it and, um, eating the wrong kind of stuff. Um, fortunately I also did a lot of exercise at that time as well. So, you know, maybe some of these things balance each other out and I'm no longer smoking and I don't drink very much anymore. Um, so, you know, who knows? And I, I don't, I don't quite know about my genes. I know quite a bit about my biological father and their family seems to be quite long lived. I don't know that much about my biological mother and <clears throat> all of her relatives. Um, so who knows? Um, and, and I could, you know, I could get sick tomorrow and, and die of something, but I'd like to, uh, even the odds as much as I can, I can do that. So I'm not like, you know, in, in the, when I was younger, I was like exercising because I really liked exercise and I wanted to be like, you know, frankly, I wanted to be like a Nietzsche and Ubermensch at one time. And, and I wanted to be able to like, you know, fight and, and, you know, compete and all this sort of stuff. Now I don't really care about any of that stuff. Now it's just about trying to, um, stay on track. All right, Zachary, thoughts on completing an online BA in philosophy? Can online discussion posts make up for in-person dialogue? I'm liking Arizona State University. Um, you know, I teach online. Uh, it totally depends on the program and the instructor. There are crappy face-to-face -face classes where the discussion is garbage. There are great online courses where um, the discussion is, is, you know, incredible. And then there's everything in between. Um, I don't know enough about Arizona State to be able to, to say anything. If they're like uh, Southern New Hampshire University, where I looked at teaching with them, it's all basically canned content. Um, they've already built their curriculum out and the professors don't really get to do much other than lead discussion sessions. Um, that could be good. That could be bad, depending on how they've built the content out and how the people are, are interacting. So I don't, I don't really know. I, there's not much I can, I can actually say about that. Um, all right. Looks like I've got my power cord is not properly plugged in. So bear with me for a moment while I see what's what with this thing down here. Um, there we go. Can't afford to run out of juice, right? Um, okay, where were we? Quinn asks, how should or can we balance reading widely with reading deeply? Um, well, I don't know. That's a good one. Here's, here's the, the, the crappy bottom line. 
Um, given the uh, the amount that's out there, you're probably not going to be able to do either one of them to the degree that you'd like to be able to do it. Um, so you know, it's it's kind of a pragmatic thing. How how much do you want to do? You you cannot read everything that's available anyway. So you've got to make some some you know decisions about who you're going to read and how much time you're actually going to put into it. Um, and there may be some thinkers who at first, when you approach, you're like, oh, this is garbage. I'm not going to spend my time on this. But it turns out later on, you'd find out that it was, in fact, worth worth spending time on. You know, uh, example I use every time, I found Aristotle incredibly boring until I got to graduate school. And part of that was my own maturation process. And part of it was learning Greek and reading him in Greek. Um, and so, you know, that may be the case for you. Um, I would say that you do want to you do want to try to read deeply with at least a few philosophers, um, and you know the ones that you pick right now, you may look back on in ten years and say, "Why did I pick that person?" You know, um, who you know what, what was going on in my head that I thought that that was really what I ought to be focused on. And that's okay. That's that's part of the that's part of the process. I think, right. Um, Made of Clay asks, are there any philosophers that may have a justified view on the use of violence, when to use it and when not to use it? I think there's plenty of them. Um, you know, if you think about like Aristotle, Aristotle thinks that you're going to have to use violence in, in some cases, right? He even talks in the politics. This is a really interesting thing. So th this came up in a Twitter conversation a, a little while back about Spartans, right? Um, there's all these people that the, these days, these bros that are like, oh, man, Spartan this, Spartan that. The actual Spartans were just a hot mess. Um, their society was, was you know, terrible for the people who lived in it. Uh, they really didn't have much freedom. And uh, they, they did manage to save Greece in a couple cases, uh, from the Persians and also from the yoke of the Athenians. But, yeah, I mean, uncritical admiration of the, of the Spartans is really kind of a silly thing because 99% 99, 99 of the, the, the bros who would like, you know, oh, I'm going to be a Spartan man, if they were in Sparta, they'd be a helot and they'd be living a crap life. And uh, if they tried to do the Spartan training, um, they would be so traumatized that it wouldn't work. Aristotle talks about the Spartans. He says that... Mm -hmm. Um, they went wrong primarily. They were very good at war and they over-specialized and they, in essence, made a teleological mistake. They thought that life is fundamentally about that. Not realizing that war and, and violence and force is for something else. And so they structured their entire society around becoming the toughest guys on the block and lost everything else that they needed in the process. So, you know, there's there there are justifications for violence. Aristotle, again, in the politics, even talks about the need for some sort of carceral system. Um, so it's kind of, you know, granted that, there, that for a lot of philosophers that, yeah, there's going to be violence. The question is, well, when when should we be violent and who should be violent and, and for what reason, right? There are some philosophers who are, like total pacifists, but um, they may uh, they may uh, sometimes make exceptions for the state. You know, think about Socrates, who um, taught the doctrine that it's better to to suffer harm than than to do harm to others. Right? He fought in the uh, Peloponnesian Wars. So you know what's going on there, Zachariah. What's your take on Carl Schmidt? Um, somebody who I haven't thought about for quite a long time. I never found his stuff all that interesting. I mean, it basically boils down to the, the, you know, the state of emergency becoming a, a regular thing and the friend versus enemy uh, dilemma. And that the fact that um, liberal democracy has trouble defending itself. Um, so uh, Mr. Dharam Paji, can I elucidate the screening process in PhD programs in anthropology or philosophy? I wouldn't have any idea about anthropology. Uh, screening process in philosophy, I assume what you're talking about is people 
uh, applying to be graduate students. So you send in your, your materials and then the committee in whatever way they're going to do it, and it's probably going to vary considerably from place to place to place, gets together and makes their decisions and then lets you know. And that's, you know, there isn't much more to say about it than that, I think. Uh, each place is going to be quite a bit different. Uh, Raid, have I read Bataille? If so, what do I think of the guy? Well, the guy himself was cra pretty crazy <laughs> as a guy, right? Uh, I like his I like his stuff. I like his writings. He's, uh, he's, he's a very difficult to categorize person, right? Um, so I, I think he's worth reading. Um, it's one of those things where you, you, you read and, and you're probably not going to buy into the whole Bataillon point of view, but, but there are some very interesting insights there to, to take from it. Um, Stephen Warren, I've been deep into Kierkegaard lately, currently on the sickness on to death. How do you think modern Christianity could benefit by assimilating Kierkegaard's ideas? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, Kierkegaard thought that, that most modern Christianity was really not Christian. It was just being a member of a club. Um, and so it's, it's not even really that clear how much of a how much a existing church could in fact be christian for kierkegaard's point of view so you know if they took that seriously they i suppose they would they would um without abandoning you know all the stuff that goes into say parish life or denominational life or all that stuff they would um really focus on the sort of like being called before God as an individual, and this would apply not just to Protestants but to Catholics, to Orthodox, because because we're all we're all individuals. And man, I think it, you know there'd be a lot of people if they really took it seriously, they, they would produce quite a few changes in behavior, because um, you know if you think about what the Sermon on the Mount commands, <clears throat> most Christians don't don't come anywhere near to living up to that, nor even acknowledge, as far as I can tell, that that's the, the should be the governing norms <laughs> guiding them, you know. Um, it's very difficult to practice, um, even with people you like, <laughs> let alone enemies or strangers. So, yeah, it, it would produce some massive changes. All right. Um, let's see here. Bastian, does Nietzsche believe in the possibility of every drive becoming satisfied or used in unison, or is suppression necessary? Contrast this with Kierkegaard's belief that with God, all is possible. Um, I mean, there's no need to contrast it with Kierkegaard. Uh, that with God, all is possible doesn't mean that every single drive is what God would focus on. Nietzsche does not think that every single drive can be satisfied or used in unison. There's always going to be some subordination doesn't necessarily have to be repression, although probably it will be, but there's going to be some something dominating and something dominated. So the question is, you know, well, what's going to be what? And where is it going to get its um, guidance from? Or what's going to determine that, I think, right? Um, wicked fatigue. Can you name some practical application for philosophy like applied philosophy? Well, there's all these philosophy of areas, right? So, you know, philosophy of sport, for example. Um, what constitutes sportsmanship? That's that's a definitional question, and we could say: Is there a metaphysical basis for sportsmanship? Is it purely something social? Well, you know, we get into all those sorts of interesting theoretical questions, but that's very applied when we want to say that person should not have been. Uh, find and there shouldn't have been a penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct. Um, there's all sorts of practical applications for philosophy, and there's many fields that are applied philosophy. All right. Um, GTA films. Are you a fan of Vince Gilligan's fiction? So that's the um, a better, better Call Saul and uh, Breaking Bad guy, right? Uh, yeah, we we got into Breaking Bad, my wife and I, after the series had already been running for a while, and we watched to catch up, 
and then uh, watched it all the way through the series end. And we've been watching Better Call Saul, and we haven't seen the uh, El Camino movie, but um, you know, because we're we're busy and we we've put it off until we have the time to do so. But yeah, I like I like his stuff. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, Samuel Mardson, when one is young, say first year at uni, is a philosophy like egoism more helpful to follow? And then as the aging process takes place, a transformation towards something like stoicism. I wouldn't say so. Why would you, um, you know, why wouldn't you, if, if one is better than the other, why wouldn't you want to move towards that right away? I mean, is the idea that you're going to like pack in your experiences of being an egoistic exploiter and jerk. And then later you're going to like have a come to come to um, Epictetus moment, like a come to Jesus moment and then change your, your, your point of view. Um, I mean, if you think something is a good way of living, pick it up now, you know, uh, if you don't, then you'll probably never get into that. Um, let's see here. Let's find some new stuff. Um, doo -doo -doo, a lot of back and forth stuff. Um, Virginia, what is the connection between the Theseus myth, the labyrinth, and mythology and the Phaedo? Well, there really isn't a connection between the Theseus myth and um, the mythology in the Phaedo. Uh, mythology, there's like a little discussion about how mythology is like misanthropy, right? Um, so I, I don't, I don't see those as, as connected, unless I'm not remembering something. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Nazim asks, what theory of predestination and election do you hold to? What do you think of negative reprobation? I don't even know what negative reprobation means, so obviously I, I don't think about it. Um, well, I think that, that we have free will. So I think that there's, you know, choices we make and we make them within contexts that we've been provided with, with the resources that we've been provided with, which then feeds back into whether we have more resources the next time around or less resources, whether we handicap ourselves or, you know, put ourselves in a better position. And I think that the way that we behave with others does that as, as well. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Jimmy from Hong Kong, are W. D. Du Bois and Franz Fanon part of your plans for future core concept videos? That's a good question. Um, Fanon definitely because one of the classes I'm going to be teaching for Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design in the fall as an online class is existentialist philosophy and literature. And Fanon is one of the people that I'm going to include in that. Um, I don't do a lot of work on African-American philosophy. Uh, I have taught courses on it when I was back at Fayetteville State University. I do like reading uh, Du Bois, but I haven't, I've, I've never like created videos on him, but I don't see any reason why I couldn't. It would be, it'd be a matter of like find uh, same thing with like Spinoza though, finding the time. Um, if I'm not teaching it in a class, it seems like more and more my videos tend to be focused on on that. Um, let's see here. Let's skip down. There's some conversation going on there. Um, a lot of back and forth stuff. Uh, John Ortiz. Why is philosophy not value in the market thought thoughts? Well, there are a lot of things aren't valued in the in the market. Depends on what market you're talking about, of course. Um, philosophy is valued in quite a few markets. You know, there's quite a few people who are in business that have philosophy degrees. <laughs> You'd have to actually like do the looking around and, and you'll find them. And philosophers do sometimes get brought in as consultants, um, and not just in ethics, but in in, in other things as well. Um, so it it depends on how you're doing philosophy. It's better it's better to like 
it's probably better to like think about these things less as like capital P philosophy covering every single thing and think about different areas. You're probably not going to, you know, get a lot of traction out there getting hired by people if you say, well, all I do is focus on this, this little conversation that's been happening among analytic philosophers in these five articles with these particular isms. Yeah, but nobody's really going to hire you for that. Or, you know, if we let, we could bash the continentals as well, we could say, you know, what I do is imminent critique. Well, what the hell's that? You better be able to explain it or nobody's going to be interested in, in that. I, you know, a lot of it, I suppose, too, is an inability to explain what it is that you do to other people. Because I don't have any problem, actually. Um, I, I, I have more clients coming to me than I can easily uh, accommodate some of the time. Uh, many of whom are coming to me from from business fields. So, um, let's see here. Do, do, do. We're getting about five the five minute mark. Um, Andrew says, "I define myself as an eclectic in my philosophical beliefs. I don't define myself as an eclectic. I characterize myself as an eclectic." Uh, could I talk more about that and why and what philosophies I admire and follow? I have an entire video on that, um, but I'll, I'll put it to you this way. So there's there's two ways of being an eclectic. One is to like say, oh, a little bit of this, 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 uh, smorgasbord eclecticism. Smorgasbord, of course, is that you know when you walk in, you can think of it as a buffet, right? Um, and, and you just kind of pick and choose, and the stuff doesn't necessarily go with each other. Another word for the kind of eclecticism that that I'm into would be pluralism. And Cicero is a perfect example of that. You learn different philosophical positions and you take from them what you think is actually valid and you take as much as you can from them and try to see if you can you know, harmonize it with the other things. And at certain points, you do have to make decisions. You have to say, well, I think the Stoics are wrong on this and the Aristotelians are right or more right. Um, you do have to set up sort of dividing lines. But you, you try as best as you can through this back and forth process to, um, to produce something that isn't just a, a, you know, like I said, a buffet uh, tray of, of stuff, like a, like a charcuterie plate. <laughs> Um, I mean, who, who do I draw on a lot? Well, you know, existentialists, dialectical thinkers, you know, you notice me talking about James. I like the pragmatists. I like some classical American philosophy. There's even a few analytics that I like, you know, um, you know, and then, you know, sort of what we call tradition constituted rationalities using McIntyre's term, Aristotelianism, Stoicism, Platonism, um, um, even the Epicureans to some degree, you know, there's, there's a lot that, uh, it, it's, it's, I don't really like play favorites with them. You could say, all right, uh, Lyndon, uh, where do I stand on the Acrasia disagreement between Plato and Aristotle? So what is the Acrasia disagreement? First of all, we should specify that Acrasia is often translated as weakness of will. Um, you could call it also failure of, of commitment, you know, failure of, of choosing what, what we ought to. It's when a person in some way, not necessarily all the way, but some way, knows the good, knows what the right thing is, and chooses something else instead, chooses the bad. Or the opposite, knows that something is bad and that they shouldn't do it, and yet they do it anyway. Um, so where do I fall? Definitely Aristotelian. <laughs> Aristotle thinks that we do, in fact, experience acrasia, and it's not just, you know, a lack of knowledge about stuff. People make dumb decisions all the time, fully knowing that they're dumb. People do, in fact, choose the bad. There's usually some motivational process going on in the background that we have to we have to think about. But I, I you know, I'm I, I'm totally on Aristotle's side on that one. Um. Let's see. Do, do, do. Let's, what can we go out on with, with one minute left? Um, let's see if we can find a, a really nice uh, thing to go out on. Um, 
Do, 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 do. There are a lot of questions down here and a lot of things also being censored by YouTube as well. Um, Let's see here. All right, let me scroll up a little bit. Um, oh, here's here's a here's a good one to go out on. Um, so it's about Leo Strauss and esotericism. Um, how do I value Strau Leo Strauss's ideas on esotericism? So esotericism for Strauss has to do with um, philosophical texts. And he says that um, various thinkers said, you know, X, but they really didn't mean that. There's really like a hidden doctrine. There's the exoteric and then there's the esoteric. And why were they, why were they doing that? Well, partly because you can't like put all your ideas out there to begin with because you might be like censored or things like that, but also to make the reader have to work. And, um, okay, so maybe there's that, let, let's consider that in the abstract. Could that be the case? Sure, that could be the case. Should we think that that's the case? Unless somebody actually, in, in my view, unless somebody actually comes out and says something about their, you know, their esoteric texts or, or doctrines or something like that, I'm pretty skeptical. And the, the Straussians, who are an interesting bunch, you know, but I, I, a bunch that I, I, I don't agree with on a lot of stuff, um, they will read into classic texts. And, and, you know, when I say classic, I mean ancient, medieval, modern, um, all sorts of stuff. And they'll say, well, this is what, what, you know, this is what Hobbes is really saying, or this is what, you know, Thucydides, or, or this is what so-and-so is really, really about. And a lot of the time, I'm I'm not persuaded by by their their points of view, and I've I've known quite a few Straussians. Um, they they were kind of a for some reason I encountered quite a few of them in the circles that I, I moved in in graduate school, and then you know for like maybe the ten years after that. Um, but I I just don't I just don't buy it. I think that we should like look at what the text actually says and unless there's some good reason to think that there's something underneath it, that's more us importing our own desire to find something in there. And generally when people have some sort of esoteric doctrine that's not really based in a better reading of the texts, that's attentive to the texts, um, it's, I think it's often for psychological reasons. People like to feel like they're in the know. They like to feel like they're special, like they've got they've got a possession that nobody else has, and it, it strikes me as kind of a, a one-upsmanship that that I don't really like. So, all right, that's uh, that's probably enough for today. I got to go eat lunch and get on with my my work, and probably have to walk this dog that you heard barking uh, before too long as well. Thanks for all of your questions. Uh, obviously, I didn't get to all of them, um, but did as many as a, of them as I could. So I will uh, see you the next time around. And I'll probably be doing another Dr. Sadler philosophy pop-up sometime this coming week.